Hello there everyone. Today we're going to talk about how quantum mechanics can be applied to the atom. So far in this quantum mechanical model of the atom playlist, we've discussed quite a bit about electron behavior, namely that the energy and position of the electron is quantized or limited to certain discrete values, and we've also discussed that electrons not only behave like particles but also as waves. One interesting fact that we discussed was the fact that the position and velocity of the electron are complementary properties, meaning the more we know about the electron's position, the less we know about its velocity, and vice versa. Another important property of the electron is its energy. The energies of electrons heavily influence the properties of the elements. For instance, what type of bond will form between two atoms depends largely on the relative energies of the electrons in the two atoms. Velocity and energy are directly related to one another according to the equation Ke equals one half mv squared, where Ke is the kinetic energy and m is the mass. Since velocity and position are complementary, and velocity and energy are directly related, it follows that energy and position are also complementary. The more we know about the energy of an electron, the less we know about the position of the electron, and vice versa. When describing electrons, we usually prefer to know the energy of the electron accurately, but the position inaccurately. We define the position in terms of an orbital, which is a probability distribution map showing where an electron having a given energy is likely to be found within the atom. Orbitals are portrayed such that the more heavily shaded locations indicate a higher likelihood of finding the electron in those locations. Not all of them have spherical shapes like the one shown here, and we'll discuss these shapes in a later video. The energies and orbitals for electrons are derived by solving the Schrodinger equation for the atom of interest. The general form of the equation is shown here. Looks fairly simple, right? Well, not really. The H stands for the Hamiltonian operator, which is actually a set of mathematical operations that show the total energy, both kinetic and potential, of the electron as it exists in the atom. An operator is very different from a simple algebraic variable. For instance, the operator ddx, for you calculus fans, is an operator that, when acted on the function f of x equals x cubed, transforms this function into 3x squared. So the Hamiltonian operator transforms a function into another function, basically. The E stands for the actual energy of the electron, and the Greek letter psi represents the wave function, which is a mathematical function that describes the wave behavior of the electron. The probability distribution map, called the orbital, is actually a plot of the wave function squared. Now the Schrodinger equation is pretty tricky to solve, and it's actually impossible to solve completely for any atom that has more than one electron, which applies to every single atom except for hydrogen. But lucky for us, we can solve the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom, and then assume that all other atoms are hydrogen-like when it comes to orbitals and probability distributions, which is a fairly decent approximation. When the Schrodinger equation is solved for the hydrogen atom, it gives many solutions, several possible wave functions. Now we're not going to get into those functions in great detail because they're complicated enough to make your head spin, uh, but instead we can look at the probability distribution and the orbitals that correspond to these wave functions. Each orbital is represented by three quantum numbers. Please don't cringe when you hear the word quantum, it's really not that bad. We've got the principal quantum number n, the angular momentum quantum number l, this is also called the azimuthal quantum number, and then we've also got the magnetic quantum number m sub l. The principal quantum number n specifies the size and energy of an orbital, and it has positive integer values, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 69, whatever, just as long as it's a positive integer. For the hydrogen atom, we can calculate the energy of an electron with principal quantum number n using the following equation, where the energy is equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules times 1 over n squared. The energy is negative because the energy of an electron in an atom is less than the energy of an electron far away from an atom, which is assumed to be zero. And if we think about this, it starts to make sense. An electron in an atom is stabilized by the positively charged nucleus, and so it has a less energy, and less energy usually means more stability. Here's a diagram of the energies of the electrons having n values of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Notice that as n increases, the energy of the orbital becomes larger less negative, in other words. Notice also that as n increases, the spacing between the energy levels decreases. Now let's move on to the angular momentum quantum number L. 
The angular momentum quantum number specifies the shape of an orbital and can take on any integer value ranging from zero to one less than the principal quantum number. So if the principal quantum number is one, then the only possible value of the angular momentum quantum number is zero. If the principal quantum number is two, then the possible values of the angular momentum quantum number can be zero or one. Get it? To avoid confusion between these two quantum numbers, we assign letters to the angular momentum quantum number as follows. S, P, D, and F for angular momentum quantum numbers of 0, 1, 2, and 3, respectively. For most intents and purposes, this is as far as we need to go. Now let's turn our attention to the magnetic quantum number, m sub l. The magnetic quantum number specifies the orientation of the orbital, in other words, which direction the orbital is pointing, and can have any integer value including zero between negative l and positive l. So if the angular momentum quantum number is zero, then the only possible value of the magnetic quantum number is zero. If l is one, then the possible values of m sub l are minus one, zero, and one. If L is 2, then the possible values of M sub L are minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2, and so on and so forth. So we can see how these quantum numbers work together by taking a look at the orbital in which the principal quantum number is 1, the azimuthal quantum number is 0, and the only possible value of the magnetic quantum number is 0. This orbital is called the 1s orbital. The 1 comes from the principal quantum number, and the s is the letter assigned to the azimuthal quantum number of 0. There is only one 1s orbital because there's only one possible value of the magnetic quantum number. It gets a little bit more complicated when we consider the orbitals in which the principal quantum number is 2. In this case, the azimuthal quantum number has two possible values, 0 and 1. Where the azimuthal quantum number is 0, the only possible value of the magnetic quantum number is 0. But where the azimuthal quantum number is 1, there are three possible values of the magnetic quantum number minus one, zero, and plus one. In the former case, we've got one 2s orbital, and in the latter case, we've got three 2p orbitals. Let's take it one step further. If n equals three, then l can be zero, one, or two. Where l is zero, m sub l can only be zero. Where l is one, m sub l can be minus one, zero, or one. Where l is two, m sub l can be minus two, minus one, zero, one, or two. So where L equals zero, we've got one 3s orbital. Where L equals one, we've got three 3p orbitals. And where L equals two, we've got five 3d orbitals. And again, the number of orbitals comes from the number of possible values of the magnetic quantum number, m sub L. Now, if you're learning this for the first time, I can totally, totally understand why you may be a bit overwhelmed. But lucky for you, we've got terminology that'll help us digest these quantum numbers. Orbitals that have the same value of the principal quantum number are said to be in the same principal level, or principal shell. Oftentimes they're just called levels or shells just to keep things as brief as possible. Orbitals that have the same value of the azimuthal quantum number are said to be in the same sublevel. So we have the S sublevel, the P sublevel, and so on. And finally, electrons that have the same value of the magnetic quantum number are said to be in the same orbital. So the magnetic quantum number specifies which particular orbital you're talking about within a given sublevel. Let's put these terms to work. In the first principal level, where n is 1, we've got one sublevel, the s sublevel, and again that's because the only possible value of the azimuthal quantum number is 0, and within this sublevel we have a single 1s orbital, and again that's because we only have one possible value of the magnetic quantum number, which is 0. In the second principal level, we've got two sublevels, the s and p sublevels. In the s sublevel, we've got one 2s orbital, and in the p sublevel, we've got three 2p orbitals. In the third principal level, we've got three sublevels, the s, p, and d sublevels. In the s sublevel, we've got one 3s orbital. In the p sublevel, we've got three 3p orbitals. And finally, in the d sublevel, we've got five 3d orbitals. All of these sublevels and orbitals within a principal shell are related to the possible values of the azimuthal quantum number and the magnetic quantum number for a given principal quantum number. All right, so now we can solve a commonly encountered problem. This problem asks, if n equals 4, what are the other quantum numbers associated with the orbitals in this principal level? Well, if the principal quantum number is 4, then the possible values of the azimuthal quantum number are 0, 1, 2, and 3. Again, that's all integers that range from 0 to n minus 1. 
where L is zero, the magnetic quantum number can only be zero. Where L is one, M sub L can be minus one, zero, and one. Where L is two, M sub L can be minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. Where L is three, M sub L can be minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and three. That is all. I know this is a lot to digest, but pretty soon I'll be uploading a video in which we look at the shapes of the orbitals, and so it won't be so hard because we'll be able to associate quantum numbers with shapes, which is going to help you out visually. And, of course, with everything else, the harder you study, the easier it becomes. I hope you found this video helpful, and as always, have a good one.